Well, hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the final round of uh, discussions at the media and the art market. Our topic this afternoon is new technologies for presenting, collecting and storing media art. To briefly cast a bridge from yesterday's discussion about the questions of whether there is actually a market for media art and our discussion today uh, let me quote from one statement uh, that I think uh, Anita Beckers made yesterday uh, that collecting media art is nothing for cowards nothing for the faint at heart it's an adventure and briefly quoting Eduardo Katz who yesterday uh, told about his own experiences in reawakening uh, some of his earlier works on the Minitel system how many people he asked that yesterday as well how many people remember what Minitel was yeah some hands I see wonderful obsolete technology yeah? we are easily drifting into the terrain when collecting storing preserving media art to be working with obsolete technology to be working with systems that no longer have a network to connect. The Minitel is such an excellent example because as a, one of the precursors of the internet, it had its own network, which is no longer operative. So the ground, the ground went off. I have uh, two guests here this afternoon. First, I have to excuse Kuishihara from Axiom Gallery who was so far not able to join our group and I welcome Henning Lohner as well as Oren Moshe here with us this afternoon. Henning, um, you are firstly, I may say, a composer, composer for film music yeah. and you're a media artist and and this brings us to the topic of this afternoon you are someone who a couple of years ago started to think really hard about the problems of preserving collecting and presenting media art please tell us a little about your own background and how you arrived at that streak of work you're following today. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Good. So um, I make moving images, what we call active images. And 30 years ago, and even today, there's hardly a way to show them anywhere. When I made my first exhibits, we made fake walls so that we could put the TV sets into the wall, cover them up so that they look like flat screens. Even today, however, the flat screens don't look like pictures. They look like television sets. There's no security. There's all sorts of problems of authorship. And anyway, uh, over the last 30 years, I've been trying to get my moving images onto the wall in the same way you can look at a picture or a uh, photograph. And, um, and um, well, we started finally, I had to uh, become a technician and build a system that is a combination of hardware and software uh, that allows us to show what we today call digital media art, but uh, basically uh, any type of um, digital content. The uh, system and the art that belongs with it 
can be seen over here in the gallery space, just as his stuff can. And um, the, the idea behind all of this is very simple. It's to make media art, or what we used to call video art, seen, yeah? so that you can actually see it without having to install it in a space. Yeah, so the difference in my, um, in, my, in my view between media art and fine arts and photography is that bringing media art to the wall space is a very, very difficult procedure. It's practically impossible because the only material that we have are television sets. Television sets or beamers are not artistic display devices. They're television sets. They're made for broadcasting, entertainment, and productivity. They have nothing to do with art. So the question was, how do we get, how do we develop what we call a digital canvas that will allow art to be seen for what it is, which is art, and not part of a content scheme for entertainment or decoration? So the question that goes along with that is that in the art market, did, and I think we all know this, digital media art is considered, uh, what do you call it? That, it? that there is no market for it. Uh, you just had a very nice quote from Anita Beckas. I would go a step further. I once uh, spoke to a, a very um, wealthy collector of mine who, uh, when asked how she feels about media art, she said, oh, it's like uh, collecting wine. You know, you collect, you, spay, you, pen, you, spay mo you spend money for an expensive bottle, and then it's nice, and then you drink it, and then it's gone. And that's media art, because one day it breaks and it's gone. And what's worse is that the awareness of the collector is like that. They assume it's just gonna be gone one day. As a matter of fact, I get a lot of um, calls from, you know, not a lot, but I do get regularly, every couple of years, I get a call from one of my collectors who says, well, you know, the hardware is not working, what do I do, you know? So we're here to solve that problem. And anybody who would like to see our solution, say it one more time and then it's up to you, uh, down, right over here, gallery space. Um, I think for now, that's, that's my part. Thank you, thank you, Henning. We'll have a couple of points contained that we will have to, I think, follow up in the discussion. Oren Moshe, uh, you have a solution ready at market, uh, which follows a significantly different approach than that of Henning's. You also spent a uh, couple of years developing that in the team and uh, you also drew from your own design and education background in the art and design world, right? Please give us an idea uh, of uh, the specifics of your approach to the problems of collecting, storing and sharing media. So I think one of the main things that you discover when you go deep into this question, into this riddle, is it's not as simple as it seems. And I think uh, it was just described in a very uh, uh, good way. Um, there's, uh, it is a, a sophisticated um, um, problem or complex problem. And it takes uh, a very uh, comprehensive solution to even try and suggest one model or one approach in, into this uh, medium. And I think one of the things that um, we were very excited about and, and were very focused about is how can we uh, find both the, 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 the real pain points that exist today, the ones that probably started back at the 60s and 70s, but also try and look forward at the next uh, uh, generations and the next years and think what would they need in order to have all these issues that we're discussing here today from the simplicity of, of uh, uploading, managing and displaying it to the big question of preserving it for, for future generations. So just in short, if, if we looked at the problem, we, we saw three main pillars. One is that this content is almost uh, hard or impossible to find. It's buried in hard drives and in um, uh, drawers of collectors and in gallery venues and in artist studios. 
usually not standardized. It depends on the year where it was created. Buried sometimes on analog or physical objects. Uh, lately also on, on, uh, on um, media and hard drives. So inaccessibility, and we ask ourselves what would happen if the main curators and the collectors and every art enthusiast would be able to go to one repository and actually find this content, both looking backwards and, and hopefully looking forward. Second thing was a, a serious lack of tools and industry standards. You look at m many other media sectors or industry sectors and, and you see that there's a, a clear standard that uh, became best practice and is uh, used by anyone who's a professional. In this medium, there's still uh, an opportunity to define that, uh, that standard. So lack of standards in preservation, lack of standards in copyright and attribution, lack of legal standards, and lack of tools to take it uh, to the end-to-end -to -end approach from the artist uploading it to the gallery or curator um, uh, reviewing it to the collector collecting it to the museum or the venue displaying it how can we find a set of uh, technology tools that make it a, a, take this complex uh, problem and make it a seamless and easy solution and the last thing but quite critical at this day and age is the the business models the fact that it is a, a niche within the art market that is still, uh, for some reason, occupied with a limited edition model. And we said, on one hand, we want to support that model. We have to support this model. We want to allow gradual uh, uh, acceptance and adoption. But on the other hand, there has to be, through technology, new models that allow more exposure, but still do not kill the, the old world of collectors. And a few different artists and collectors are experimenting with these uh, ideas. So inaccessibility of content, lack of tools and standards, and uh, the, the, the lack of new business models we, we found by interviewing clearly hundreds of people from, from the art world were, were, were the, how the, the problem should be explained. And the solution should probably be, and this is what we have went out and developed and is uh, now available, some sort of a virtual roundtable that actually invites each and every entity from the art world to be both using this as a private tool, but also be easily exchanging the content between themselves based on the different use cases or workflows that they need. So that is, in a nutshell, um, the type of problem and a very, very high level description of the solution. And if you want, we can go deep into it. And I think. In the, the place in which we probably complement each other is uh, uh, we just heard uh, um, this phrase that uh, hardware is critical and if you don't use the right hardware uh, you maybe are disgrading the art and we took almost a, a, an opposite approach and said we do not want to deal with hardware, we don't want to dictate the hardware, we are willing to be on any hardware. We want it to be a simple technological software solution that can allow the artist to use the best tools and the highest uh, quality, but not be limited, not to format, not to resolution, and not to a certain uh, device. And we want it to be a very controlled system, but also very open, so that we can collaborate with hardware manufacturers and with different entities, etc. So that, in a, in a nutshell. May, may I ask uh, you, uh, Lauren, directly, your model is, to simplify it a little, although it's pretty complex, a cloud-based platform solution offered to all the stakeholders in that game of presenting, collecting, storing, etc., media, art. That's true. Um, how do you hope to bring uh, the missing standards, technical as well as legal especially, um, into place? What is your platform doing that those such standards come upon? So first of all, I think the most important thing is, again, to understand that this is a complex riddle and no one entity and no one individual can dictate a solution. It has to be a modular solution that understands deeply the problem, but also allows um, both a suggestion using different entities that already introduced different protocols. There's the loop protocol, there's different standards that are used by major galleries. There's a few serious collectors, uh, like Alain Servé, that are uh, um, publicly talking about the needs and the elements that need to happen within contract and, 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 and legal standards. And same thing uh, exactly with, to do with preservation. Although media and technology are always changing, there are some uh, theoretical and, and practical uh, uh, solutions 
to looking a few years, maybe 10, 20 years ahead and trying to at least document uh, and, and allow the most important elements of technology and, and, and uh, documentation to, uh, to be uh, reproduced in the future or to be re-rendered in the future. So, for example, our platform allows uploading the master files and any type of documentation and it automatically can render many different copies as we move forward into new, new codecs. So, both legal and preservation has best practices that are done by other entities that are very happily willing to collaborate in order to put this into a modular technology that already exists. And the fine tuning could be based on that template. So every gallery or every artist, instead of having, in a weird way, their own lawyer to actually review each and every transaction of one file moving to a museum or moving to a collector, could enjoy that very simple template standard that is already available and then tweak it and add their own nuance uh, 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 approach to it. So that's just a very clear example of, of where the, the market could benefit from that. It takes all the entities to, to collaborate for it together. Henning, uh, to fully understand your proposal, your solution, uh, you come more from the hardware side, in a way, but only in a way. Um, and is the assumption right that out of the entire landscape of media art, which is a very vast and diverse landscape, you take out, as you said, digital content, image-based art that can be presented on certain types of screens or similar devices following a set of standards. Is this assumption right? Yes, uh, yes that's true, but it's not the only thing. There are um, the, the the effort in standardization uh, is an effort in in a building an um, an industry interface that will allow all the participants to communicate with each other. Uh, we have in this regard we're doing the same thing, but we have different solutions which hopefully will uh, be um, beneficial to each other and to other solutions that you know I think the time is right that things will happen with media art, uh, but not just media art, the way that we can present digital images without them being um, compromised by their technology. The effort in standardiz standardization is like um, in the music industry, we have the, the MIDI standard because all the music making companies uh, realized that the electronic instruments could not be played together. So they had to find a, 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 an interface that would allow all these different instruments to play together. This is, I believe, in a certain way, where we are at. We need a software, we need a, a hardware, and obviously to support the uh, art and the content in a way that every artist can use it. Without being compromised, without compromising uh, the intent on the wall. Now, your your question was what? The question was about uh, uh, taking from the entire existing media art those types of art that can be fit into that model. Yes, that's right. It wouldn't apply to any type of media art naturally. Well, uh, that's the thing. We uh, we're about. Um, we're about the wall space. So the observation is that you know, 90% or 100% almost of media art is installation based. What we would like is looking at the photography art market to allow digital artists in the same way that photographers do to put their images on a wall by having them in a framed what we call digital canvas. That is our specialty. We're not, like you are, about supplying the digital media world with more opportunities to, uh, excuse my pun, but to, to install, yeah? It's, it's much more about the, the ease and simplicity of use, and that's where we're the same again. We're trying to find a way to make this easy for everyone. And in creating a value proposition, 
which has to do with standards, which has to do with business, that is the way that we believe, I believe, we can, uh, we can uh, lift digital media art and photography art from the niche that it is in today. We should not be blinded by the fact that here at Ars Electronica, everybody is there. This is the entire community. This is it. That is a very, it seems like a large group of people, but it is not. It's you know, 500 people, 1,000 people worldwide. That is much too small to build a market. So what we're professing to, and you are in, the same, in a similar way, is to incorporate all the artists that use digital media. If you imagine that a photographer today, usually a professional photographer, will use a digital camera, he'll use a digital medium for post-production, color correction, and all of this, and then he has to print to paper. So what we're suggesting is that this should become a natural end-to-end -end digital process whereby the artist can build in digital, edit in digital, and show in digital. Okay. Are you considering interactivity in that concept? I can, I can follow the model for photographers, which you kind of quoted, yeah? Because uh, there, the wall-based uh, solution is yeah, the majority of solutions you would find. With media art, I would say it's not. As you said, a lot is installation based. Does your model mean, uh, if, I, if I take the position of the artist, and my art is installation based, I have sensors, it reacts to the people entering my piece, it's site specifically set up in a certain situation, it uh, uh, evolves uh, by learning algorithms through the usage, etc., etc. Just, just giving random examples from the world of media art. Uh, and I come with that piece to your solution. Uh, you would tell me, I put it a bit provocatively in shorthand, uh, you would tell me, okay, with this type of work you will reach a certain number of people but it's a limited number of people, and people won't install that in their homes. This might be shown in a museum, at a gallery, at Ars Electronica Festival, etc. Uh, they won't have it in their homes. You, you're telling me? Yes. Okay. Uh, and you're, you're proposing to me to create a version of my piece that would work in a screen as we have here on the rear wall. What? for what you could provide me with standards, support, and so on, so that longevity would be guaranteed to my piece and the rollout to the market. Is, is, is this approximately with all the... <laughs> approximately, yes. Yeah, approximately, yes. Uh, what we want to do, and, and, and uh, I know you have an answer to this, um, what we want to do is enable the artist to show his work on the wall space in an adequately aesthetic, high quality device. So of course, it's not just about hardware. What we offer is a system that is, uh, in a certain kind of way, similar to iTunes, where you have hardware, software to support the content. Uh, really, the iTunes model is the idea for what we're doing. Um, you, you go ahead. So I, I think this is a very important issue because this is where, of course, every solution is, is relevant and, and, and projects a, a very s s uh, specific concept behind it. And there's a concept of, of very closed and very controlled and very specific solution. And there's a, the concept of having a lot of modular elements, a bit more, although it's controlled and easy to use, it's a bit more open and inviting. And therefore, not only that you invite the niche art market with all its entities, from the artists to the curators to the galleries, collectors, etc., we are actually, as NEO, the, the, the platform, we've created strategic partnerships with these hardware manufacturers. So, for example, they can not only um, uh, distribute and, and, and install the product itself, 
on location for these artists. They can even add all these elements that you've uh, mentioned earlier, the audio elements, the interactive sensors. So if you truly want to solve not just video art market or ju not just photography market, but actually everything's digital, everything new media art related, you must take into account these modular and different needs. And, and again, not limit artists to a certain format, to a certain cropping, to a certain solution. They can install uh, uh, sensors, projectors, audio elements, but because they document everything within the platform, it is very easy to move it from one location to the other. And because these hardware manufacturers, luckily for us, do have standards, you can actually reproduce this with either uh, very minimal uh, IT teams or even no IT teams at all, using technology, using these standards. So you transfer one file, or you can transfer potentially a full exhibition with all the instructions and the technological elements to be recreated almost at no cost on another side of the planet. So again, modular versus uh, uh, extremely controlled. Let me ask you something. But uh, in, in regards to his question, which I didn't answer, uh, in terms of streaming and interactive stuff, uh, you, you still have to stream, right? Again, the, the, the solution, once you move from just one video file or one photography into a full new media project, if you may, you have to, to act uh, uh, towards it as if it's a, a, a complex project. So as a complex project, it will have many different files. It might be needed to download and replay it on site. Every, of these, um, every one of these uh, um, formats needs to have a very specific standard to accompany it. But once everyone agree on that standard, suddenly the gallery, the artist, the collector, the museum, everyone wins, and the installation becomes very simple. Let me address one aspect uh, you mentioned, that is um, you have the file, of the digital file of the artwork, and you have the documentation. Uh, you mentioned the complexity of issues involved in conserving, in let's say, keeping a piece alive. Yeah. Um, if I now take the role of a person striving to collect certain pieces of media art that interest me from different years, different eras, um, would the documentation really be sufficient? It's essential to have it without the documentation, yeah. But uh, would it be really sufficient? Wouldn't it be rather the case that I needed a kind of art service agreement yeah, with some structure uh, of experts who would be able to tackle those problems? Yeah? If I buy the piece now from a gallery or in an auction or negotiating with the artist and I get the documentation, I'm no technician. I maybe probably can't even read the documentation. Uh, do you have solutions for that? I think there's, again, intermediaries needed. So uh, documentation is just one element of the preservation solution. If, if I go back to the Neo platform uh, main pillars, then the first one is, uh, is quite a robust uh, cloud platform that allows to uh, upload hundreds of gigabytes of files, put them in a context of a project, add many different file types and documentation onto that project, and then be able to use it first and foremost privately to display or to loan it. Once that is done, one of the things we're putting in there is the raw files. So once you have the raw file, you can also re-render it, for example, in the video case, from 8K uh, raw to any type of codecs that will uh, in be introduced in the future, be it streaming, be it download. So for example, our platform moved from H.264 to H.265, which is a codec in, a, in, a, in an automatic process. No creator needed or gallery needed to do anything in order to enjoy that change. So if, if you look at it as a preservation solution, there's certain standards and certain experts in this field that are coming together again to define that standard with us. So you have different backup locations, uh, local and on the cloud. You have many different ways of reassuring that when the file is moved from one location to the other, it doesn't uh, get corrupted, and so on and so forth. So once you put it in place one time, now everyone in this industry can uh, enjoy it. So the pillar of cloud preservation is, is a critical one. And the use of it as a private tool, as a private collection tool. Then comes the player that takes it to the wall. Then comes some sort of a transfer mechanism that allows you to share it with others 
under many different terms, commercial terms, legal terms, etc. Henning, you mentioned in the beginning of our talk uh, the thing about uh, certain collectors uh, expecting the pieces to die. Yeah. Um, well, eventually any artwork will one day fall to sand. One day, but that might be a long time and we hope it to be so. Uh, are we now at the crossroads for media art? If I listen to your concepts, yeah? Uh, and excuse me again for maybe simplifying them. Uh, are we at the crossroads that tell us, okay, adapt, adapt with your artwork, emulate, port it to another platform that's more sustainable, standardized, or let it die when the time runs out and when the, the circuits have no electricity in them again? Well, I believe that, um, or actually it's my experience in speaking to collectors and uh, people in the art business, that um, I, forlo I forgot what I was going to say. What was the question? Oh, right, yeah, that um, there is a very, very large learning curve to accept what is coming. People look at digital art or anything that comes through the wire as something that is free and available to anyone and is aloof, basically, just like the Internet. So from my point of view, one of the, most, one of the largest challenges is to educate people. I have had... Uh, collectors come to me and say, well, your art needs electricity, so that's bad, right? Because I can't take it with me. My response was, well, how do you look, how, at night, how do you look at your paintings? Well, I turn on the light. So you see, people don't understand easily the difference of very simple things. For instance, that electricity will never ever go away again. Electricity is here, in one form or another, is here to stay forever because if it leaves us, we all die. Not just the art, we all die. But in the, it, curiously enough, in the art space, you find many people who don't understand these concepts. They think if I have an oil painting painted with oil, somehow that has more durability, more value than something that is electrified. That attitude Yes, I would say is going to change drastically, but we're going to have to put a lot of effort into it. Particularly if we don't, if we want to reach people outside of the artists. Museum people are somewhat receptive, but coming to collectors and then galleries, very, very complicated process of education, but it has to happen because electricity is not going away. So I, th I think I would um, uh, agree that we cannot predict the longevity of, of, of human culture and, uh, and of art, but uh, of course whoever is caring about uh, our culture and mainly about uh, the important uh, role of art in it would probably agree that at this day and age uh, digital art, new media art, video art are probably um, the art much more related into what's happening in society, into the uh, knowledge revolution and probably looking backwards people will claim that this was the most important art done at this time and I think it's it's important that this industry this community will collaborate in order to make every effort possible to document or to even make sure that the longevity is as uh, as long as possible and as, as I said there's institutions both academic institutions uh, MoMA Tate and others that are putting time effort, resources, and have the knowledge of what does it take to preserve uh, media art, uh, interactive code-based art, video art, at least to the highest standard no known to humanity today. And through technology, when an industry agrees to standardize and when new platforms are uh, introduced that are actually able to solve it for everyone, we will have the most documented and the most uh, probably imported collection of, of media art and digital art for the next generation. So. Maybe we cannot tell if it will last for all eternities, but we can make every effort possible and the knowledge exists and the technology exists in order to make it as long as, as possible. Uh, 
thank you for bringing me to two more, I find, crucial, crucial points. Um, I see another crossroads ahead of us if I look now at the uh, solutions you propose and the situation we are in. Um, there may be one way, one alley, which is the path of the museums, art institutions and scientific institutions who strive to preserve art as true as possible to the original artist's intention, as true as possible, due to the best of our knowledge and abilities. This needs a lot of insight, time, and resources. So it's a public, it's a public good which you have been addressing. The other side is the art market. Yeah. The art market has its own dynamics. Yeah. Here we are about uh, questions uh, that uh, Henning raised, uh, finding the, the proper uh, distribution models, as you quoted, the iTunes model, for instance, etc. Uh, models that allow art to reach larger markets, scalable markets. That's a completely different uh, scenario, and it seems to be, at least from the pictures you are drawing with, with your proposals, uh, to have uh, reverse effects on the art. I'm not judging on that, but I tried to describe it as that. I will have to adapt to certain standards yeah, in a multi-polylog uh, uh, negotiation process or by accepting uh, the solutions you, you propose and you're offering me something for it. But it, it, it does something to my art. Yeah? So that's, uh, that's something to be, to be weighed or pondered. Right? But I think it's two substantially different uh, ways uh, where media art can be going. I would just uh, like to make the clarification that I don't, I don't think um, when you look at the standards, they're the, the, at the infrastructure level. They're at the core of how the industry, how the community, how the, again, artists, galleries, collectors, creators, museums, etc., are just communicating with each other. It has nothing to do. It's, uh, it's actually the opposite when it comes to not limiting the artistic formats and the artistic capabilities. Because once this is solved, then everyone is free to do the other part. And when it comes to, uh, to video art or media art, you have basic formats, but if you build it modularly, it's infinite. And I, I think this, this is probably what this medium will need. A, a, a core set of standards that are in the infrastructure level. Again, an artist doesn't need to be creative when it comes to a, a, a legal uh, contract. He doesn't need to have a budget for a lawyer. Not the artist, not the gallery, not the co collector. And it shouldn't be a game of power who's winning that negotiation. It could be just a win-win standard that then frees them to look at the, at the uh, conceptual and, and other uh, uh, aesthetic elements of the piece and, and just define by that and, and very easily be able to expose it while still controlling it and not fearing that it will lose its value or uh, it will lose the scarcity model if that is the model that the artist and gallery and collector are choosing to, to, to impact. The other aspect that came up in your, your previous statements is that about the audiences. Uh, of course we do want to present art to informed and prepared audiences especially so with media art. Uh, this is, as any museum people know, any gallerist knows, any art educator knows, a complex task. Yeah? Just a label on the wall won't do the trick. It's more complex than that. You want to enter a conversation with the audience and it's a process over time. It's not one visit to the museum and then you're in. Yeah, it's a longer, longer thing. Um, how do your models uh, interface with that, with that problem? Yeah. Both of you, you, neither your platform nor your solution is an art institution. It's a public, it's, it's, it's something different. Yeah. But you have the problem uh, of uh, desiring to have, um, to have uh, informed and prepared audiences. 
yeah, to make this happen and to make this into, let's say, a successful experience for everybody involved. Uh, you go on that one. So, I, I, I think, I think uh, again, it, it comes back to um, uh, the basic concept of what a needed solution for this medium will need to have. And I mentioned earlier that virtual roundtable, it has to be a collaborative effort that first and foremost puts professional tools in the hands of the people already holding this medium, which, by the way, I don't see as a niche medium. I honestly think this is a very important and growing medium. And if you look at it, again, from the eyes of people looking backwards years from now, they would probably see other artists and other creators and other uh, initiatives in, in different eyes than we see it from where we stand today. So, so it's probably much, much larger. There's millions of digital creators around the world. There's half a million students graduating from art school every year. So, so, so the, in, the, the community at large is, is very big. But g getting back to your question, this is exactly why a curator and an institution is part of the platform. So we're not telling, not the artist, not the gallery, not the curator how to explain the work, but we're actually giving them technological simple tools in order to explain them. So when they upload the file, it's not just a video file that needs to be put in the hands of the IT team to be played. It's a full uh, description, including also the educational level that was mentioned before. Could be even a narrated uh, explanation. And the beauty of it, it is done once and then everyone can enjoy it, as opposed to how this industry is op uh, operating today, which is unheard of in other businesses. Everyone is doing it all over again. The same uh, description, the same artist bio. Every time, each museum, each gallery recreates the same thing, not to mention the contracts. So, so and, th and, and that's exactly why there is no market, because you, <laughs> yeah, because of the limit, yeah, it's, that's it. You have to have some sort of a standardization or an interface, some sort of uh, means of communication that everybody understands easily so that you can actually build a value proposition. And without a value proposition, whether it's monetary or idealistic, you do not have much. You've got individual efforts that don't lead to anything. I agree completely, and I think the call is to the people who care about this uh, medium from the artists, uh, etc., to collaborate in order to open these bottlenecks that are very easily open in other industries and in other media sectors. And once they're open, we can then see for ourselves if this is a niche uh, medium or not. I, I strongly believe that this is not a niche medium. On the, on the contrary, maybe the most important and, and growing sector of creation today. As we're discussing markets, yeah. Uh, of course, the question of the business models behind your two solutions uh, should be raised. Yeah. Uh, does I understand substantial effort to be taken to provide your solution, to provide your platform? Who is paying the bill? <laughs> I am. <laughs> he is. The, so, there's no way that any one of us can do this without idealism. Excuse me. In my case, it took me uh, basically 30 years to think about how to get money to develop what we're developing. And in our case, we found a commercial solution that pays for the art. So myself as an artist, may, uh, in the process of making something, releasing something that is a completely outside of art, a commercial 99 cent store for what we're doing, that pays for why I'm here right now. So, so we, um, we, we took a, a, a bit of a different approach because we're uh, looking at what we've created as real tools that are solving real pain points and that actually people are paying for today. These museums, these collectors, these galleries are actually paying these IT people and, and, and many different unintended tools and many different unintended processes in order to solve what, what we feel can be easily solved by uh, automa automation and, and technology. So A, the ability to, of course, because this, is, this has to be a standard, then there's always a basic package that everyone can use for no uh, payment whatsoever. But then as you become a professional and you use it in order to save you money or to make money, then of course you pay for the tools and you pay a certain commission both for the platform and for the entities involved in your success, your gallery, your art dealer, your curator, or your uh, uh, um, exhibition, whoever is taking care and, and showcasing your work. So there's practical business model even when you start with the tool approach. 
when you look at what technology can offer to this medium, it can still sustain and has to sustain uh, a model of scarcity. But because we can monitor, we can uh, use blockchain technologies and other technologies in order to take care of authentication, because we can use players that can send the file and then re revoke the file when the time limit ends, suddenly new interesting models uh, appear without collapsing the old uh, establishment. So you can suddenly very easily loan a very uh, expensive piece with the click of a button and get it at the highest resolution possible on the other side of the world, playing with no IT intervention and then getting back to you anything to do with some sort of rotating exhibition that you suddenly can expose others to. So uh, uh, an, an, an invitation to, for, the, uh, for the community, not for us, to, to rethink new models uh, uh, while still using the old models is suddenly very possible and very uh, attractive, we feel. So these both aspects, tools and also new models for, for collection or for ex exposure, we believe will bring, are bringing budget and money into this uh, medium. We need to look at other industries that have adapted to these technologies and are actually solving this very easily. So this is not a new, uh, a totally new concept. It just need, needs the right tailoring in order to adapt to this medium. We've been uh, quite some time discussing amongst ourselves the issues of those two solutions here on the table. I ask uh, our questions to the panel, to the two gentlemen, from from your side, um, things you would want to know about their solutions or general uh, questions about the problems we have at least been trying to touch upon. Mm -hmm. uh, might I bring them? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very interesting panel, thank you. Uh, the question is for Oren Morshi. What other industries are you considering that are models for what you want to do? You said at the end of your last question, we should look at other industries that are somewhat similar or similar enough that we could consider those as instructive for the model that you are presenting. So, so there's a variety of uh, solutions that we can look at from uh, solutions dealing with tools and, and uh, a full range of uh, creative professional tools. Uh, I mentioned earlier non-intended solutions, so m almost all the, these, in, uh, these, these communities are using cloud, cloud solutions, again unintended. Um, things to do with display mechanisms and display uh, um, devices, as another example, the signage solutions and other solutions that again are unintended but people are, are paying for them. But if you look at the core, which is the distribution, we can look from uh, app stores and, uh, and uh, Google Play to even platforms like Netflix that are allowing uh, sometimes uh, in, in, in the music industry, they even allow, bo allow both accessibility and some sort of ownership or download uh, uh, approaches. The only uh, thing to really, really uh, mind is that it is a different medium and it takes totally different nuance, very well tailored tools in order to be able to adapt. But once you do this adaption, the basic principles remain. So accessibility, paying for SaaS models for tools that are actually saving you money, and uh, some sort of uh, uh, f few tiers uh, commission model based on, on content uh, ownership and content uh, usage from, from the platforms that I've mentioned. There's really a, a variety of, of, of these, um, I, I would say, for each of the pillars of the needed solution, there's some examples of non-intended tools that are actually used today and can be adapted into this model, and kind of like taking them all together and creating that a general uh, uh, pr problem solving solution at one place where you don't need to combine WeTransfer with Vimeo with this and with that in order to get that flow working. So I don't know if it answered your question, but that's... Uh. I'll, come, I'll come over there. Uh, yeah, th uh, thanks for a really interesting um, discussion and I managed to get to the session um, yesterday as well where there was other perspectives. Um, for me, I, I am an artist. I've, I've um, 
I've worked through from fine art, from printmaking to photography, uh, analog projection of film, and now into digital media art, as we're sort of calling it. Um, and I've been trying to get my pieces into traditional galleries, if you like, painting and sort of photography galleries, mainly in London, where I'm based. And, um, and I'm not getting really any success um, and, and not even getting much response. And, um, and it's certainly first and foremost, I think it's this, the psychological side of it, you know, is actually the ownership aspect. And obviously the platform is, is very important, but I'm, I'm not so concerned about the platform. In fact, I'm working with more mobile devices as displays. And, and I really quite enjoy the aesthetic of the, those displays. But it's, uh, as I say, it's the, the big, ch you know, to me is, uh, and this is not necessarily absolutely relating to what you're talking about as such, but it's such a psychological thing of ownership. And obviously reference my printmaking background is, you know, editions, and obviously that's talked about in terms of media. But it's, um, um, I think, uh, uh, as it was mentioned here, it's the education side of it to gallerists and, and therefore, your buyers and so on and it seems to me that it's um, the question as well is uh, is investment because obviously if buyers pay a lot of money they want to safeguard their investment but principally art is obviously the buyers want it they want it because they uh, they enjoy it and you would hope that actually the the investment is less of a, a concern and just added to that you've got say examples like David Hockney who's obviously really moved through lots of media and medium um, and he had his joiner film pieces and I think there's because he's an established artist he's um, uh, I think he's have less of an issue it's, it's the difficulty is is for for new artists you know to break through um, for obvious reasons really and then they're less where I think people buyers are more inclined to say buy a, a Hockney joiner movie which he had at his Royal Academy show a year or so ago and obviously they're they're buying into a name and possibly, I mean, I don't know if he sold any of those or not, but I, I imagine he may well have done. So, so in a way, mine's more of a statement than a question, but it's just uh, very interesting to, I mean, I'm very pleased that this is happening at Ars Electronica, because it's, a, you know, for me, it's very, very crucial, really. So, can I, uh, sorry to go on. Just, uh, I, I think, again, the, the most important principle that we find relevant for this uh, community is not for any platform or any individual to dictate a solution or to dictate a way to collect or a way to uh, distribute or a way to monetize. What we're actually saying is there is a real problem. Let's give the tools that are solving the problem of today but are modular enough to also invent solutions of tomorrow. So the same gallery, the same artist and the same collector might decide that some works are collected as limited editions and the others are um, distributed on different models from loaning to accessibility, etc. Uh, I see the biggest problem in the hardware because uh, all the hardware which is around, it's, it's consumer hardware. It's built to hold for one year, <laughs> maximum two years. Every week there comes out new hardware. The producer, they don't care about standards. They built into the hardware now a lot of things. We don't know what's built in the hardware. So how, how, how will you deal with the hardware problem? Well, that's exactly why we spent the last 30 years building what you can see next door. We propose a new hardware that is geared towards the wall and has nothing to do with television. It's actually based on photography uh, standards and uh, the quality issues have nothing to do with the tele everything that you mentioned. That's why I say, you know, I say that's why you can't show art on TV sets. So, so first of all, this is a valid solution, but it does dictate uh, a need to buy the hardware. And, and, and another, approach, another approach would be um, there are standards in the, in the hardware game that are not the consumer standards. They're actually professional grade displays by the big manufacturers, like, such as Philips, the strategic... N not necessarily, and always will, always will uh, um, uh, you'll pay always less and less for better quality, which is what technology does any, anyway. But uh, 
projector companies like Barco and, and uh, uh, hardware manufacturers like Philips are creating professional grade devices that are meant for 24-7, three to five years warranty. They know this business very well. We don't need to, to, to tell them how to do it. And the beauty of it is once it dies, after five years, you just replace it with a new one, but you don't need a technician, you don't need the artist, you don't need the gallery. It just works on the new device because it was based on technological standards. Same as happening today with your phone. You replace that phone, but the content remains. The contacts, your photos, everything from the cloud back on your phone. So. You know, in terms of hardware, what he mentioned about standardization, you have to start somewhere because making hardware is very, very expensive. Making it, yeah, the, the development costs are millions and millions of dollars. So most people can't make that. And in order to start some sort of uh, new hardware system, you have to achieve, obtain standardization so that people can afford it. Nobody's going to put down a million dollars for one screen. So you're going to have to make several of them. And it's not about making a mass product. It's about making a new product. Yeah? And the new product has to be designed in the same way that he's designing his thing with a new approach from the original. Yeah? I agree with you totally. When I look at what they call standards of, of image quality in television sets, I have to run to the bathroom because it's all a joke. It's a joke. It has nothing to do with real standards, uh, particularly not if you're looking at picture quality. So this is a discussion one could get into in, in very much detail, obviously. But you have to start somewhere, and we started somewhere with a hardware solution that is not a television set. And by the way, still, everybody comes and says, what kind of a TV set is that? What kind of a TV set is it? And that's the other problem that you were mentioning. We need to educate people. Yeah? The reason a lot of these uh, screens are hanging vertical is because they don't, at least then they don't look like a TV set. But you'd be surprised at how many people think it's all about television, and it's not. Thank you. Although we have reached the end of our session this afternoon, this is clearly not the end of discussions about media art and the art market. Uh, well, I thank the two gentlemen for joining us today and uh, they are still around and they are present also in the gallery exhibition if you have additional questions about their solutions. It's in, in, the, in, the, in the long uh, stretched gallery out space. Yeah. Yeah. And I thank you for joining us and uh, being with us for this discussion. And I wish you a uh, pleasant and inspiring few more days of the festival. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs>